almost everything you'll see in this series was filmed aboard the International Space Station. At the end of March, Mikhail Kornienko, a flight engineer decorated with the hero of the Russian Federation title, went there on a 342-day mission. The world history of space exploration hasn't seen long-term expeditions like that for 20 years. From the very first weeks of his space adventure, the Russian astronaut has been making videos about the workings of the station. Now you have a unique opportunity to be the first one to see rare scenes from space. You will get an insight into the life and operation of the ISS, the most unusual science laboratory ever created by humans. Dear friends, I'm really glad to see you again. I'm going to take you now on a small tour around the station and give you some comments and explanations. Journalists often call our station a home in space. And it is true. I'd like to show you the rooms of our home, the things we do here, and the equipment we have, the general setup of our station. I hope you'll like it. Five years have passed since Mikhail Kornienko's first mission. The orbital complex has changed since then. New equipment was delivered into space. More opportunities for scientific experiments were made available. Work on the station became more interesting and life more comfortable. Let's start from my quarters, dear friends. In Earth terms, it's located on the ceiling of the station in the module of our American colleagues, No. 2. Apart from being my bedroom, it's also my office. I guess it's an office more than anything else, because I sleep here according to our internal schedule. From 10 p.m. till 6 a.m. Here's a sleeping bag of a nice light green color. We come here, get inside the sleeping bag, and zip it up. We sleep in the bag so that we won't be floating around. It's very cozy and comfortable. Here I have two computers that I can use to communicate with the ground and to check my schedule for the day. I also have internet access. So I have everything I need to live, work, and relax properly. I can watch movies, I can even call my family and friends when I'm in the reception zone, and I have some free time. So this is my personal nook, nice and cozy. I guess every astronaut should have a place where he can spend some time by himself, sort out his personal stuff and talk to his family. And of course, do some work. Here I have my personal belongings. These are my family photos, my parents, my mom and dad, a small icon, my wife, my grandson. This is my home away from home. Almost all year round, the ISS is inhabited by an international crew of six. The station has Russian and American segments. The American one also includes laboratory modules that belong to European and Japanese space agencies. Their ascent to orbit completed the construction of the U.S. sector of the space station. The Russian sector, however, is still being built. One more research module and a remote manipulator system have yet to come. Let's start our tour with the Japanese module, JEM. It's also called Kibo. I'm going to talk about the equipment we have here and its purpose. At the moment, no work is being done here. So I'm just going to show you this amazing lab where a lot of very interesting and valuable experiments are carried out for the benefit of humanity and Earth sciences as a whole. The Japanese module basically consists of two parts. Here you can see the first one of them, JLP. This module, JLP, is used for storage purposes, 
It has all sorts of cargo in it. This is the hatch of the JLP module, which we are supposed to close in case of emergency decompression. They can be sealed very fast. Okay, let's continue. Right now we are looking at the pressurized module of the gem. It has two windows and a big platform attached to it from the outside. The platform allows us to expose different kinds of experimental specimens that we put there with a robotic arm. This is the robotic control workstation. The remote manipulator system is a very complex piece of machinery that reminds you a little bit of a human arm with a hand, an elbow and a shoulder. And it's quite difficult to manipulate. But there's an option of automatic control, meaning the ground can send a program for this arm to execute. This is how this experiment module looks from the outside. Today it's the biggest one on the ISS. Although there's no Japanese representative on the station now, the module's in operation. Some researchers are being conducted here that do not require the presence of astronauts. This is a Russian experiment called Matryoshka. It's like a Russian nesting doll. It's aimed to study the radiation dose that an astronaut is exposed to during his mission. This sphere is imitating a human body. It has dosimeters inside that we take out before leaving and bring back with us to Earth. Then scientists check out the cumulative dose of radiation. The properties of the materials correspond to those of a human body. The entire control of the station is performed via laptops. Here, you can see a work laptop with the connection zones marked on it. The green squares mean full connectivity. Sadly, we are not in that zone all the time. But most of the time, about 70% of the 90 minutes revolution around the Earth, we do have connectivity. The American Dragon spacecraft is docked right at the entrance, or at the exit, depending on how you look at it, of the GEM module. It arrived here several days ago with a load of various cargoes. That's why it's a bit messy here now. Part of this cargo is stored in the multi-purpose PMM module. Part is stored in the GEM module. And some cargo is in the Columbus module where we are heading to right now. The Columbus module of the European Space Agency. All in all, it's also a big laboratory, and everything here is covered with laptops and cameras. I'd like to single out this payload rack here. It's a science rack, like the rest of them. It can dispense different gases or create a vacuum for all sorts of scientific experiments. Here you can see the Space Portable Fire Extinguisher, PFE. And a portable breathing apparatus, a mask with a small oxygen tank that has the operating capacity of 7 to 10 minutes. At the end of this period, it has to be hooked up to an oxygen port. All of this is the Columbus module. There is a clear sign of a girl living here. At the moment, the master of this place is Samantha Cristoforetti. She's the commander of this module. Samantha Cristoforetti has already returned to Earth by now. With almost 200 days aboard the ISS, she broke the record for the longest space mission by a woman. Hello. The American segment of the International Station comprises several modules, some of which have been in space for almost two decades. For example, the Unity module, also known as Node 1, has been orbiting the Earth since December 1998. Here we have something of a recreation area. This is the dinner table. Sometimes on Fridays or Saturdays, we gather here for a meal. But usually, everyone has their breakfast, lunch, and dinner in their own segment because lunchtime and dinner time are often not synchronized. 
This is the Node 1 projector. This allows us to watch movies and different TV programs on a big screen. Every compartment of the station has its purpose, but because of the limited space on the ISS, a module can become multifunctional. The Node 3 is busy with work. Our American colleagues are performing an experiment that requires moving some payload around. Our expedition commander, Terry, is moving the so-called crew transfer bags that house the equipment for experiments. This module is also our gym. Also, this is where our colleagues take care of their personal hygiene in the morning. But I think we are going to cover this subject better in the following programs. Terry, thank you. You are welcome. On behalf of our viewers, no problem. No problem, Terry. The treadmill is also located here. Like I said, this module is a small gym. There's a special harness that is placed on astronauts' shoulders to give him some weight in a microgravity environment. And this is the computer that is used to control the T2 treadmill that I showed you already. Everyone has his personal profile. See, Samantha, me, you select your profile, set the parameters of your workout, and run. Five kilometers, six kilometers, whatever the distance you've been assigned. Right now, Samantha, we visited her quarters already, is working out on the ARED weightlifting machine. It's a very complex system. At the same time, it's very efficient and comfortable. It allows you to exercise all major muscle groups. Amazing machine. Samantha, say something to our viewers. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Mikhail is trying not to bother other crew members, so he's filming most of the modules when they are empty. This is yet another American module, the airlock. It was designed to host spacewalks, and indeed here we have two spacesuits. And now we come to our sanitary facilities, a space toilet. Its operating principle is similar to that of a vacuum cleaner. I want to point out that it was designed by Russian scientists. It has a very good track record, having been used for many years on the Mir station, on the Salute station, and now on the ISS. There are two toilets like this on our station. And finally, the American storage module, PMM. It's being used to store various payloads. I'm going to show you how big it is. If you were to fly past the station, you'd say this module is located on its bottom. It's kind of like a cave to give you a more vivid picture. And I keep drifting forward. It's like a subway car that's been put up vertically. Sorry for my feet getting in the picture. It's not so easy to hold a camera in weightlessness and watch out for your body at the same time. We are now at the very bottom of the module. And I'm going to show you its top to give you a feeling of the distance we've covered inside. That's how big this module is. Next, I'm going to show you our Russian segment and I hope you'll understand how big this station is and how many rooms or modules it consists of. We are floating past the docking port. This is the mating adapter of the functional cargo block, which was the first one flown into space as part of the International Space Station construction. It was like a foundation for the construction of the ISS. The Zarya module, also known as the functional cargo block, was launched into orbit in November 1998 by a proton heavy carrier rocket. The 12 and a half meter long module weighs 20 tons. Initially, it was responsible for the control of the station, providing it with energy and maintaining the stable temperature. With new blocks added to the ISS, most of the vital functions were transferred to other modules. This is the device that ionizes the air on the station. It ionizes the air, cleans it, and enriches it with useful negative ions. 
and this is the module's exit hatch. Let's have a look inside the MRM-1 module that is docked to the mating adapter of the Zarya module. MRM, short for Mini Research Module, is a scientific laboratory, a storage facility, and a docking port for Soyuz spacecrafts at the same time. Having been delivered to the station in May 2010, it's a relatively new module. Stored behind these panels are a lot of different cargoes. Here are two fridges. The orange boxes host various scientific experiments. These are emergency packages. If an ammonia spill takes place on the station, we need to respond immediately, because breathing in that atmosphere for longer than one minute can burn your lungs. So in that case, we would have to put on breathing masks, shut off the American segment, and take other actions following a certain protocol. And over there is the Soyuz spacecraft that brought here Anton, Samantha and Terry Wirtz, who is currently in command of the station. Soon, in three weeks, they will return back to Earth on this ship. Let's proceed now to the MRM-2. The ship that brought us to the station is docked to it. It's our lifeboat. Our Soyuz is a reliable and nice machine. And here are our spacesuits waiting for us. Further down is the descent module where we sit during the return trip. To line up my narrative, I'll show you how the Earth looks from the window of the MRM-2 module. You can see the solar arrays of the service module and the radiators of the American segment. Of course, the camera doesn't show you all the colors, everything a human eye can perceive. It's a gorgeous view, especially at sunset and sunrise. Same as the American segment, the Russian part of the ISS has its own module designed for spacewalks. Here we have two spacesuits, same as in the American airlock. Don't be surprised, my friends. I didn't clean up here on purpose. I wanted to show you the real life aboard the station. This is a towel. Over there, behind the spacesuit, we have fans. We put towels here on purpose to get them dry because they are completely wet after washing. This is the air duct. The SO-1 module has a cargo spacecraft docked to it. It's almost filled with garbage and soon it will undock and leave. Another ship will take its place. Right behind the section with the cargo vehicle docked to it is the biggest lab of the Russian segment. Zvezda, also called the service module or SM. Both on the outside and on the inside, the module is fitted with a wide range of equipment. Here you can find photography equipment, medical devices, and means of protection for emergency situations. Three isolating gas masks. Each one can work for an hour and a half. They will protect us in case of fire or ammonia spill. The word isolating refers to the fact that it has a special cartridge which when activated releases oxygen. It has enough oxygen to last you for an hour and a half. On the floor of the SM module, there are six windows that we use to take pictures of Earth. We place our cameras like this and shoot different objects. For example, right now there are wildfires raging around Cheetah City. Scientists of the Ministry of Emergency Situations charge us with taking images to enable a fast response. And this is a weigh-in device. Hopefully I will show it to you in action, but right now we don't have any task requiring it. When we'll be doing it, I'll show you how it works. And here we see crew quarters of the SM module. There are two of them, one on the port side and one on the starboard side. This is the crew quarters of Anton Shkaplera. It has a window, whereas the one I live in doesn't. It's a huge deal, of course. I'll show you the view of the Earth from the window one more time. This is the view an astronaut gets when he wakes up. And this is Guiana. 
He's talking on the phone. Actually, he's trying to get through, as I understand. I'm trying. Here, I got through. Got through. This helps a lot. It's really nice when you can call your family and friends in tough moments. Gennady Padalka is the most experienced astronaut both in Russia and in the whole world. It's his fifth expedition. By its end, Gennady will set a new record for the time spent in space. Upon landing, the total duration of his expeditions will amount to 900 days. I will show you the Russian segment and the American segment from outside. Right now we are looking out from the cupola. The cupola is used for work with robotic arms. This robotic arm allowed us to put together the entire partner segment, all of its modules. And the solar arrays were deployed using this robotic arm too. I'll show you some of the solar arrays and the true structure they are sitting on. Unfortunately, I cannot catch all of it on camera. The arrays are up to 50 meters in span, and the truss structure is 100 meters long with eight huge batteries at its end. The external structure of the station deserves a tour of its own. On the outside, the modules are fitted with the most diverse equipment. The way it works and the role it plays in dealing with space garbage will be covered in the next episodes of our TV project. Here at the station, we are neither on Houston time nor on Moscow time. We use Greenwich Mean Time. All crew members, regardless of their nationality, use GMT. When we wake up in the morning, we start our day with personal hygiene routines, same as on the ground, although weightlessness has a certain impact on that. Everything has to be done with the utmost care and caution. This is the place where we take care of our personal hygiene in the morning, in the evening and after working out. So this is our space bathroom. Every crew member has this kit called Comfort with all the toiletries we might need. You can see now what's inside it. It has everything you need to clean yourself to brush your teeth, and so on. There are toothpicks, a nail file, a hairbrush, a hand cream, shaving cream, aftershave, a toothbrush, and toothpaste. Okay, so let's get to brushing our teeth. I'm taking out my toothpaste, no brand names, and my toothbrush. Carefully, same as on Earth, I'm applying the toothpaste onto the toothbrush and putting the toothpaste away to prevent it from drifting off. I'm getting a bit of water into my mouth from the drinking water bag. And get down to business. With light moves, I brush my teeth, same as back on the ground. Then I wipe out the toothpaste with a cloth and put it carefully into a plastic bag to be thrown out. I get some more water in my mouth for rinsing. We don't throw away wet napkins. They can be put here on a fan to get dry. Water is circulating on the station like in nature. We have a regenerating system here that extracts water from the atmosphere. This water is then purified and used again. I prefer to start with shaving. 
And my choice is an electric shaver. Here it is. Nice and easy to handle. I could fool around with it like this. Okay, I'm taking off the protective cap, put it in the toiletry case so it wouldn't fly away, and start shaving in front of the mirror. Gennady Ivanovich, though, is used to a different way of shaving, and he'll show us now how to do it in space. Each crew member has a razor and a set of razor blades. And the cargo transfer bags over there contain a lot of spare razors and razor blades. A shaving cream. After shave. I'm spreading the gel over my face with a light circular movement. Next, I'm getting a napkin. Must be dry. I'm removing everything from my fingers. Right, Mikhail Borisovich? And then I'm carefully shaving off my stub. everywhere. I'm wiping off both the gel and the stub with this tissue. Then I take a wet wipe and remove the remaining gel from my face. We use the same wipes in the morning to wash our face. Great. This napkin is wet, so I'm leaving it to dry up. That's because we have to fight for every gram of water on the station. The more water we save, not save actually, preserve. As the water is recycled here, there's no point in saving it. But the more water we preserve for a regenerative system, the less water has to be delivered here from Earth. I'm finished with my shaving now. And as a final touch, I'm applying aftershave. I really like this one. It's soothing and doesn't have a strong smell. Smells can irritate other crew members, so it's better to choose something neutral. Right, Mikhail Borisovich? It should be neutral. Exactly. So that's how we get about our personal care in the morning. Usually I also use a hand cream. The air on the station is quite dry because of the air conditioning system. We don't have enough moisture. So it's better to moisturize hands to prevent skin from becoming dry. At first I neglected doing that, but then I realized that it's a very important thing. I developed skin rashes and hangnails. But it all went away after I started using hand cream. Throughout the year, the ISS is inhabited by an international crew of six people. Three of them are Russian cosmonauts. The rest are representatives of American, European, and Japanese space agencies. Space tourists or short-term visitors. The flight schedule ensures that a crew is replaced every three months. Today, our crewmate Anton Shkaplerov is flying back to Earth. He's been working on the station for almost 200 days, and I'm sure he misses his family, his friends, his home, and our amazing planet Earth. Anton, could you share with our viewers the feelings of a man who is soon to be back home after working in space for more than a half a year? I'm so far from that myself. The floor is yours, Anton. Well, what can I say? Naturally, at the end of the six months, I feel somewhat tired. But it's quite understandable. Although, we have some scheduled days off, and even several holidays, astronauts don't relax in their free time. They tend to grab a photo or a video camera and take pictures of the Earth and other celestial bodies. Do something that you can't do back on the ground. So, of course, there's some tiredness. 
Emotionally, I'm in good spirits. The expedition is coming to its end after being prolonged for more than one month. So I and my crew completed everything we were supposed to do, and we are getting ready for the descent with a sense of, uh, of accomplishment. I'm so jealous, Anton, but in the best possible way. Shall I maybe show our viewers what's happening outside the window of your quarters? It's a solar orbit, so nothing is happening there. There's only sun. As a good host, Anton is showing us the view, but unfortunately, we're on a solar orbit, so it's too bright. But you still can get a general idea. We are now in the mini research module MRM-1 that has a Soyuz spacecraft docked to it. It's the ship that brought Anton here and will take him back home. I'll show you the Soyuz, talk a bit about it, and explain how the crew is preparing for descent. We are entering the Soyuz spacecraft. This is its orbital module, also called BO. Let's see what's inside. The console here has a BO manual control unit. A pressure and vacuum gauge and valve controls. This is a transfer hatch with a docking probe, a portable pressurization unit for emergency situations. It contains compressed air, some personal belongings of the crew, spacecraft documentation. During descent, the orbital module undocks from the descent module and burns in the atmosphere with all the waste inside it. We are now approaching the descent module. Here's Anton, the spacecraft commander, getting into his central seat. Just so you know, the seats are tailor-made. They are molded to the body of an astronaut at a special Zvezda factory called Zvezda. During descent, astronauts experience serious G-loads. They have to be distributed evenly. It's very important for prevention of any traumas and injuries upon landing. A person grows up to two to three centimeters in space, so we do special fittings before boarding to eliminate possible problems. We measure the distance between headrest and the head. It shouldn't be less than around um, a centimeter and a half. The width of a finger, as Anton is showing us. This is the allowance for a spacesuit that naturally has a volume of its own. This is the way we store our spacesuits. This is Samantha's spacesuit lying in her seat on Anton's left. And the spacesuit of Terry, our current station commander. They will have the spacesuits on them during descent. A very important thing to do before the return trip is to pack payloads in the descent module. As you can see, the descent module is very small, so every centimeter is precious. We are trying to fill all available volumes with payloads. There are special pockets all over the inner surface of the descent module where we can put different items. There's some free space here behind the main parachute the backup parachute, and behind the commander's headrest. There's also a special payload container, a quite a big one, under the commander's seat, but it can be reached only after the seat is lifted up. We are distributing payloads according to a special radio message which was prepared on the ground. Some items in that list are special. They are marked with orange color. Here I have an orange package of that kind. It's a bioecological calcium experiment. These packages are the last ones to be put inside, only several hours before the hatches are sealed. And of course, they will stay somewhere nearby so we wouldn't have to lift up the seat. They are also the first ones to be taken out immediately after landing. They contain experiments 
that either have to be put in a refrigerator as soon as possible or passed on to Earth scientists for further investigation. Among the things that we bring back to Earth are our personal belongings, like this pouch here weighing one kilogram. It contains all my personal stuff. There are some photos and letters from friends and family. This is my youngest daughter. During these six months, they were warming my heart, reminding me of Earth and providing me with a sort of psychological support. That's it. Okay, guys, it's time. Let's go. Embraces, kisses. All right, bye. Bye. Good luck, my friend. Bye. Hang in there, Misha. It's just a year. Misha, creepies, creepies, God. Yes, I really enjoyed flying with you. I guess Anton go first. Okay, and then Samantha. All right, yes, yes, yes. Goodbye. Bye, sweetie. All the best. Good luck. Do your best. Bye. Bye, sunshine. Good luck. Did you make the photo? Yeah. All right, then. See you later. See you back on Earth. Bye. See you on the ground. Antoka, we still have contact via comms, guys. Good luck, good luck, good luck. Thank you. That's it. Is it closed? Did you close it, Anton? All right. Tighten it up. Got it. Several minutes still on docking. Checking systems D11 on D15 on D17 on three, two, one. Here we go. Undocking achieved. We have separation. TMA 715 is pretty in departure. Observing the docking port, no foreign objects detected. Everything is nice and clear. Bye bye. Bye. We are saying goodbye to Anton. Godspeed, guys. Anton, Samantha, and Terry are returning home. These are the last moments of their expedition. You can see the thrusters of the spacecraft firing and the ship goes down underneath the station. Three hours and two orbits later, the crew of Anton Shkaplerov is being met in the steps of Kazakhstan. Anton, then follow me. If only you would always carry me like that. No back pains, no vertigo, or maybe just a little bit. Here's my report. All crew members feel well. The landing went down without a hitch, no injuries. We're prepared for further reconditioning. A mobile lab of the Institute of Medical and Biological Problems is being set up right there in the step. Some tests have to be made straight after landing. Then the astronauts are transferred with helicopters to the Karaganda Airport, where a special flight bound for Star City is waiting for them. The astronauts are about to embark on a long journey of post-flight rehabilitation and adjustment to regular life on Earth after a long time of working in weightlessness. Of course, goodbyes are always a bit sad. We had a good working relationship with the previous crew, but closing one chapter means opening a new one. For more than one month, it will be just the three of us flying aboard the station. But then a new team will arrive. 
Uh, we are looking forward to seeing them, to getting new experiences. They are old friends because we spend a lot of time training together on the ground. And their coming also means new work. But before meeting the next crew, Mikhail Kornienko and Gennady Padalka had to meet the Progress Resupply Vehicle. The docking was performed automatically, and astronauts filmed it with onboard video recorders. It might look as if the spacecraft is very slow in its movement towards the station, but in reality, both objects are flying with the first cosmic velocity, almost 28,000 kilometers per hour, or 8 kilometers per second. It's 200 times faster than a car on a highway. And it's the smallest speed that allows the ISS to move along its orbit. Slowing down even a little bit will make the space station fall down. Today is a nice, joyous day. Finally, after a long break, a resupply vehicle arrived. The first thing we do is we open the hatch of the SO-1, the docking compartment to which the cargo ship has docked. We are leveling out the pressure using the valves right here, and then open it like this. And then we fasten the hatchway cover. You can see a number of connectors along the perimeter that hold the docking probe, which I'll show you now. This is a docking probe that allows both a cargo vehicle and a manned spacecraft to dock to the station. I placed it here temporarily to show it to you. It has to be dismantled after the docking because it's blocking the hatchway. We always take it off and then put it back on when the time of undocking comes. This is how it looks. See how easy it is to play around with big masses and microgravity? It weighs half a ton. Yeah, it's very heavy, but I'm rotating without any effort. That's how it looks. A unique product designed by Russian engineers. After dismantling the docking probe and opening the hatches, we uh, start unloading the ship. The resupply spacecraft delivered equipment, water, fuel, air, oxygen, food and home packages. Gifts from family and friends. The total mass of the payload is almost two and a half tons. Water and auction are delivered with the help of these valves. We hook up our utility systems here, water pipes included, then water is pumped into water dispensers, food warmers, the electron system that generates oxygen, and uh, wherever else it's needed. The crew is unloading the spacecraft, putting everything in its place. The directions as to where those places are come from the mission control center. Ground control sends us a special diagram that shows all these items and where we should stow them. So I select an item here and take it to the designated storage place in the SM module, FGB module or whatever place is listed there. This is how we are unloading the supply ship, carefully, meticulously, so later we would be able to find the items we need using the same database. There are lots and lots of things on the station, and this database can literally save the day. The mission of the cargo vehicle doesn't end with the delivery of supplies into orbit. It will become a working part of the station for the next several months. In some cases, even the engines of a cargo vehicle might be utilized. For example, when there's a need to change the altitude of the station's orbit to avoid collision with space junk. Nevertheless, progress has already served its main purpose. Today, Russian cargo spacecrafts remain the most reliable vehicles of the orbit range that have been providing the International Space Station with supplies for many years. Well, dear viewers, let's talk a little bit about space food. Today, Mikhail Kornienko is taking everyone to the space kitchen. He will show you what the ISS crew has for lunch, how to season soup with salt, and how to drink a glass of water in weightlessness. You will also witness one of the medical experiments performed on the astronaut and see the sunset the way you've never seen it before. 
through the windows of the International Space Station. Just look at how short it is in space. Food supplies are delivered to the orbiting station several times a year by cargo vehicles. The crew has a so-called standard menu, compiled during the preparation stage back on Earth and based on personal preferences of every astronaut. The selection of space dishes comprises a total of more than 200 items. This is our space dinner table. I'll show you what we are having for lunch today with the help of my friend and expedition commander, Gennady Ivanovich. Today, we are lunching with beef fajitas from our American partners. They are contained in this package and need to be reheated first. For this purpose, we have a special food warmer. We put the food item over here under these strings. This surface is hot. Then we close it. And in 10 minutes we get hot beef fajitas. But let's leave it for now. And go back to our table. I'll just close the warmer. Not to waste tea, as Gennady Ivanovich pointed out. Rye bread. Really delicious. I have to say. Gennady's choice is a can of salmon and jelly. Those are really small cans. As an appetizer. And my appetizer would be eggplant caviar. This is mutton with vegetables. This is a space soup. I will show you how to turn it into real soup. But first, let's go over the rest of the things here. These are biscuits that were delivered by the cargo vehicle 428. They were sent to me by my family. They are really nice and delicious, but unfortunately, they are not included in the standard menu. So my family helps me out here. And this is a cream soup that Gennady Ivanovich, sorry for slang, whipped up for himself. Almost all of the food supplied to astronauts is produced at a special space food factory, which is absolutely unique in its operation. Apart from canned foods, it mostly manufactures freeze-dried products. First, the dish is cooked in a usual manner and subjected to freezing. Then a special technology is used to extract all the liquid. To turn the dehydrated soup into a normal one, astronauts simply have to add some water to it. This is how this soup looks. I showed it to you already. I tear the vacuum package open and cut a hole in the pouch for putting in water. Notice that I don't cut it all the way to prevent that small piece from floating around. It's very important in weightlessness. We don't want any flying particles or objects that can get into your eyes, lungs or somewhere else. There's a valve here that I use to hook up my soup to the water dispenser. The manufacturer recommends mixing it with 200 milliliters of hot water. So I turn it on and press the button. The water starts going into my soup. Hot water. 200 milliliters. And then I shake it like this. I have some drops getting out. To deal with them, I need a towel, but we haven't brought it yet. And in 10 minutes, 
I will have a delicious vegetable cream soup. Just give it time to dissolve. And to keep it hot, I have this thermos. A personal thermos. Yes, my personal thermos. They send us these sort of Ugg boots here. There are some cold places on the station, and these boots keep your feet warm. By the way, I go on spacewalks in these boots. I put them on before donning a spacesuit. They are very soft. They conserve heat and my feet don't get cold. And they also keep my soup hot. This is what they call street smarts. And now, let's go back to the main course of our space menu. Mutton with vegetables. We have a special heater right here. I turn it on, open it, and put the can in it to heat it up. Yeah, get a closer shot of the slots. There's a special adapter for smaller cans, but my eggplant caviar doesn't need to be heated. But it's possible. You just put in the can like this and its bottom would touch the heating element, so you can heat up small cans with meat, for example. Close it and turn it on. Wait a minute. And then we put in our bread. Rye bread with coriander. There are special slots for bread here. And wheat and rye bread, just like this. Close it, and in 10 minutes we'll get a can of hot main dish. We'll open it and have our space lunch. Bread for the ISS crew is baked in Moscow in a scientific research institute for the baking industry. Compared to your regular bakery, its output is really small, only 50 kilograms per year. kilogram of space bread accounts for 800 of these loaves. Their small size ensures that astronauts don't have to cut or bite them in microgravity. After baking and packaging, they are subjected to a special heat treatment. High temperature kills bacteria and mold spores, which should be prevented from getting on the space station at all costs. Well, dear friends, let's get down to our space meal. My lunch is hot now. So, I'm taking the can out. Beef with vegetables. It's really hot. Mutton. Mutton with vegetables, yes. Oh, did I say beef? I misspoke. And then I do this. I already opened one can, so I won't open this one. But this is a regular can opener provided to us by RKK Energia. It has the corresponding logo. Here is my eggplant caviar that I have opened already. We are going to eat it. This is our bread, see? Oops. It went flying. Fingernail size. This is salt, our special space salt. Actually, it's a water-based salt solution. You have to understand what can happen with regular salt in microgravity. It will fly all over the place and can easily get into your eyes. Not a pleasant experience. We have different appetizers. This is a Caucasian appetizer and horseradish and a lot of others. We didn't want to take out everything. They bring diversity into our ration and make it nicer. Here we have a clove of garlic that was sent here on the recently arrived cargo spacecraft with the rest of condiments, food products, apples, and onions. Show the dessert, Misha. Yeah, dessert. We were sent these candies. Both me and Gennady Ivanovich drink tea without sugar for health reasons. So we are chasing it with some candies. Back on Earth, I don't have a sweet tooth, but here, priorities change and your body starts craving sweets. So this is all I have to say about our space food. Water, same as food products, is delivered to the station by resupply spacecrafts. 
A cargo vehicle is carrying around two tons of payload, a bit more than two tons. This includes water, oxygen, maintenance equipment for the station, scientific equipment, and so on. These valves allow us to transfer water and oxygen to the station. We hook up our utility systems here, water pipes included, and pump water into Rodnik tanks of the service module into American CWCs, contingency water carriers, and also into our water containers called EDV. Then the water is pumped into water dispensers, the food warmer, the electron system that generates oxygen, and wherever else it's needed. Proper use of water and weightlessness is a science in its own right. Special systems and unusual inventions are there to help astronauts save water. In space, every milliliter counts. I'd like to explain briefly how a space cup works. Our Italian colleagues recently sent a coffee maker to the station that works in microgravity conditions. And they also sent us cups that allow us to drink in weightlessness. This is how they look, a broad base and a narrow tip. Because of the capillary action, water comes to the narrow part of the cup and you can drink freely from it as if you are on the ground. I'm going to show you. This is how we drink our coffee. You know, it's a really unexpected piece of comfort drinking from a cup in space. Our next piece is about behavior of water and microgravity without these cups that I showed you. This is Gennady Ivanovich taking care of me, so I would stay full of energy during broadcasting. This orange was brought to us by progress. Anyway, we have these water bags aboard the station. I'm hooking it up to the dispenser. You can probably hear it working now. The bag is expanding. That's it. We got ourselves a full bag of clean, potable water. I'm closing the tap. And now I can drink this water. Actually, it's not water. There's a hint of lemon. Lemonade. I put in a straw and open it. You can see that it's not leaking. No water gets through it. It's a very convenient thing. And I can drink from it just like this. I open the valve and you can see how everything went flying, small droplets of water. You have to be really careful with water in weightlessness, especially when you wash yourself. For example, after working out, because it starts flying all over the place as you just saw. So here we have our lemonade. This droplet will become a perfect sphere once it settles down, and it has air bubbles inside. I will even get out of the picture so you could see it in a close shot. And now allow me to actually drink this thing. You know, lectures usually have a glass of water in front of them. And I have a dry mouth as I feel nervous speaking in front of such an honorable audience. So I'll take the liberty of drinking this. Thank you. The service module in the Russian segment of the International Space Station is a multi-purpose block. It's a galley for the crew, a vantage point for watching the Earth through the windows and a laboratory full of various scientific equipment. Today, you are going to witness a medical experiment on Mikhail Kornienko. The astronauts filmed it in real time, specially for our viewers. Copy, Mikhail. We are ready. Great, then. We are ready, too. Let's start. Good afternoon, crew.
Well, my friends, I've been assigned an experiment. To avoid making a mistake, I will read the goal of the experiment from the paper. The goal is to establish a connection between changes of blood pressure in the carotid artery caused by redistribution of blood into the upper torso in microgravity and changes in sensitivity of the central mechanism of respiration. To translate it into plain English, this device here creates negative pressure on my legs. Blood redistributes in my body almost to match its distribution in earth gravity. It's called Chibis. Yeah, this machine is called Chibis. At the same time, it's performing an EKG. I have electrodes under my T-shirt and measuring my blood pressure. During the experiment, I will hold my breath for as long as I can after inhaling or exhaling. Full exhale and hold your breath. So now the ground control tells me to breathe out and hold my breath. Complying? The negative pressure Chibis suit forces astronauts' blood system to work as if they were on Earth. It basically pulls blood into his legs, whereas in weightlessness, blood constantly rushes to his head. This is done to simulate Earth's gravity. It makes my blood redistribute. I hold my breath after fully inhaling and then after fully exhaling. And then the same sequence is repeated with negative pressure. Fully inhaling and fully exhaling. Then the difference is analyzed and scientists reach some conclusions. That's the essence of the experiment. Later they will give us some recommendations about fighting the negative consequences of life in microgravity. Michal, exhale and hold your breath. Copy. Fully inhale and hold my breath. Say again, is it exhaling? Full exhale. Copy. Exhale and hold my breath. Copy. The ground control is closely watching the experiment, so the only thing left for Mikhail Kornienko to do is to follow commands and listen to the radio. Every day, astronauts take part in several scientific researches, provide maintenance for the orbiting station, take a lot of photos, and make videos. Crew members have a really tight schedule, and even their free time and days off are often spent at work, so appealing with its out-of-this-world beauty. I guess watching the Earth from the International Space Station and generally from space is one of the most majestic and amazing things to do. In these moments, you feel especially grateful for the unique opportunity to look at our planet from this distance, to see the entire Earth when you are so far away from it. You have a special appreciation for the wonderful world we live in. Trust me, our planet is the best place in the whole universe. At least I haven't seen anything more beautiful from here. Not a long time ago, we have passed Moscow and Star City. Unfortunately, the orbit inclination is about 40 degrees, but in good weather conditions, the structure of Moscow is clearly visible and you can even take a picture of Star City, although at a big angle. Right now, we are getting close to the Ural Mountains, which I want to catch on camera. I can get a shot of the southern part of the Ural Mountains. No wonder astronauts take so many wonderful pictures during their mission and then post them 
on social networks like Instagram. One moment, and I think it's really great that we have this opportunity to take pictures of the Earth because there's no one else to see it from this distance. Hopefully, you will also be able to enjoy these views with my help. I'm going to show you one of the most amazing places on the station. It's located in the U.S. segment and called Cupola. It's a sort of observation module facing Earth with six windows that give you a 360-degree panoramic view. And of course, when you dive in there, you have an unforgettable experience. Let's go. Well, we are in the cupola now. Amazing place, as our American space friends like to say. I will show you several views that open from this amazing place. Consider them just space sketches. This is the remote manipulator system that was used to assemble almost the entire station. It's a Canadian robotic arm, so we go to Canada to receive training on this system. It's a very complex thing with a complicated control system, but it's very effective. And here we can see a rotating antenna that provides us with communications. Next, our MRM-1 module that was delivered here five years ago on my first flight. And this, my friends, is our cargo vehicle that we were so excited to meet. And finally, watching Sunset Online. Just look at how short it is in space. Amazing view. That's it, the sun is gone. The only thing left is a blue strip of the atmosphere. In just 24 hours on the space station, you can watch 16 sunrises and sunsets. That's how many orbits the ISS makes around the Earth in this period of time. So by the end of his one-year expedition, Mikhail Kornienko will complete more than 5,000 round-the-world trips. But even though he has such a unique opportunity, his biggest dream is to come back home. People often ask me what I miss most in space. Well, the answer is probably trivial. I think being in space, all astronauts, without exception, miss the Earth. Although the views here are spectacular. But sometimes you just want to walk on dew-covered grass, to swim in a river, to look up at the sunrise, not down and you want the sunrise to last for as long as it is supposed to, not just 10 seconds, like in space. Of course, I want to go back to Earth, and every one of us misses it. Space 
spacewalking is the most dangerous work one might need to carry out during the expedition on the ISS. Today, we are going to show you how Russian cosmonauts prepare for and explain why they even need to leave the orbital station. You will find out who manufactures spacesuits that are resistant to temperature drops and radiation. You will also see how crew members relax after hard work outside the station. Dear viewers, a little bit of space acrobatics. It's quite common for people on Earth to call it a walk in space. But in reality, extravehicular activity, or EVA, is a necessity. It's the type of job without which the ISS couldn't have been built and successfully operated for so many years. Assembling new modules, installing various equipment, conducting a whole range of scientific experiments, performing station maintenance, all that requires regular visits in outer space. We will perform the spacewalk in Russian Orlan spacesuits. Right now the crew is getting them ready. We are changing the replaceable components. Here you can see the insides of the spacesuit that ensures our vital functions in outer space. The blue part is a liquid-cooled garment that an astronaut puts on before egress. We are going to adjust the size of the spacesuits. There are special straps inside them that allow us to do that. We use them to change the length of arms and legs. Also, every astronaut chooses gloves of his size. Without special equipment, a person wouldn't live in space even one minute. Temperatures ranging from minus 120 in the shade to plus 140 in the sun, vacuum, and ionizing radiation. But spacesuits do more than just keep a person alive in this hostile environment. They make it possible to work and achieve clear results, be it science or further building and upgrading of the orbital station. Every spacesuit has a lifetime of up to 15 spacewalks. In between them, Orlan doesn't have to go back on Earth. All the maintenance is performed on board. Certain structural features allow for size adjustment so that one spacesuit can fit two astronauts of different height and build. Spacesuits are stored in the docking compartment, which serves as an airlock from which we start our EVA. And of course, spacesuits have to be prepared for a spacewalk. We get them ready for service by checking equipment and systems and changing the replaceable elements. We install new oxygen tanks, both main and backup, check if they are filled up. We take care of the lithium hydroxide cartridge that removes carbon dioxide during a spacewalk. We also have to put in new moisture collectors and new batteries. As the spacesuit is autonomous, we don't use umbilicals. Instead, a special spacesuit battery provides energy for all spacesuit systems. I'll tell you a little bit about preparing a space suit for service and handling its replaceable units. Right now, I'm opening the small door through which an astronaut enters the spacesuit. As part of the preparation, we check the liquid-cooled garment that provides thermal regulation for a spacesuit operator. This is a headset used for communication sanitary gloves. By the way, we install a new set of gloves on the spacesuit every time. They are disposable for safety reasons. At the very most, we might use them two times. Almost all of the equipment is installed right here. 
behind this cover. Battery is also located here, but I'll put it in later. Here we have the main oxygen tank, and here the backup oxygen tank. This is a lithium hydroxide cartridge, a liquid collector, and a tank with water used for cooling. A spacesuit is like a thermos. It's both heat and cold proof. That's why working in it would be physically impossible without an additional special suit. We should check the liquid cooled garment to make sure that all the water tubes that you can see here are intact, that inflow and outflow are in order. The garment will be hooked up to the insides of the spacesuit. It is responsible for cooling down the body of an operator working in the spacesuit. You can decrease cooling by slowing down the water flow with a special regulator on the front face of the spacesuit. The garment is hooked up to the water system of the spacesuit with these connectors. They come in different sizes, so an operator can choose one suitable for him. During the preparation, we also clean water systems in the spacesuit and in the liquid cooling garment to remove all the air bubbles. One of the replaceable elements is an oxygen tank. I will now replace the main oxygen tank. With a pressure of 400 hectopascal, it works for six to seven hours, even up to eight. The backup tank is used in case of emergency. If the integrity of a spacesuit is compromised, we have this diagram on the glove to help us calculate the time we have left. So, with the pressure staying at 400 hectopascal, the backup tank will last you 30 minutes, of course, if the leak is not too big. It's plenty of time for the operator to get to the egress device, get inside the docking compartment, close the hatch, and start repressurization. Altogether, onboard preparations for EVA take about three weeks. They include multiple inspections of the spacesuits, certain operations in the airlock, the starting point of a spacewalk, and configuring instruments and systems that will be needed on the outside. Nothing is too important here, as the stakes are very high. Pressurizing spacesuits for practice in the backup airlock of the transfer compartment. Right now we are pressurizing the spacesuit to the 0.2 level. The spacesuit is equipped for egress. All detachable components are in place. I have 0.2. 0.2 pressure leak testing is on. In the course of training, Gennady Padalka and Mikhail Kornienko imitate various nominal and emergency situations. Out there in the vacuum of space, they have to be prepared for any turn of events. Today, as part of preparations for our EVA, we had to make this package. At first glance, it might seem disorganized, but in fact, it's very practical and thought out. We can open it up while wearing the spacesuit with our hands and gloves. Inside of it, we have, for example, some containers. That's how they look. I'd like to point out that every part of this package is secured with an RET, which is short for retractable tether. They prevent things from floating away. Here we have sealed containers, three of them actually. They are designed for collecting samples outside the station at the outlets of the electron system and in the thruster firing area. Later, all of them will be analyzed on Earth. Also, attached to this package, on the outside, is this tool with special swabs, designed, actually, for cleaning of the exterior window surface. In the course of the station's flight, you know by now that it's been quite a while, 
they become covered with an oily film caused by engine burns. So we have to clean it off to restore good visibility. So today we prepared these two packages. I haven't told you yet about this one. Here we have scissors to cut the antenna cable. It's about this thick, so the scissors are reinforced. We have a reel of new antenna to replace the old one, some carabiners. And here are some fasteners. I guess this doesn't tell you much, but anyway, these are the two packages we are going to take with us outside. We are going to talk now about removable equipment installed on the spacesuit before a spacewalk. This equipment includes carabiners that prevent spare parts from flying off into space, tools, and so on. This is a so-called OTA, short for Orlan Tether Adapter, which is rigidly mounted on our spacesuits in two points. It has a swing arm attached to it, this small foldable platform. The swing arm is fitted with a tool called a caddy, a small platform for different tools. For example, a wrench, a stopping box, a torque wrench for tightening bolts and nuts. It's very easy to handle even with your gloves on. A range of carabiners. This is a small retractable tether, also called RAT. It can be used to secure some equipment, like these fasteners, to prevent them from flying away before installment took place. After installing the fastener, the carabiner naturally unclasps. We also have big retractable tethers. They come in large and small sizes. An important part of a spacesuit is a GoPro camera. Being attached to a spacesuit like this, it films everything we do outside the station with a wide-angle lens. To prevent the camera from getting too hot or too cold, we keep it in a sealed box. Then we close it, like this, and it's now as protection with a heat reflective sheeting. Both spacesuits have these cameras. There are also American cameras attached to our helmets. Moreover, our actions during the spacewalk will be followed by stationary cameras outside the ISS, which are installed on the SRMS arm, also known as Canada arm, and along the truss. Our camera can both shoot video and take photos. Naturally, it is secured with a small retractable tether called an RET. And this Velcro holds it in place on the spacesuit. After egress, we will move them a bit higher to have a clear visual on our work area and to take pictures of the entire station. All right, and now I'll try to show you our movement routes and working areas. Astronauts exit the station through the VL-1 hatch of the Russian airlock. Then they bring the equipment to this egress device and secure it. Here you can see a solar array. A soft handrail will be installed in this area. From here, astronauts will proceed to the assembly compartment. Over there, in the very end, you can see a small piece of the service module of the Russian segment. The assembly compartment is where the new antenna will be in installed. So the crew will be working at the end of the service module. Unfortunately, we can't see the fourth surface with the window that 
которые будут подвижны. Has to be cleaned. The first one to egress the station is the more experienced Gennady Padalka. This is his 10th spacewalk. For Mikhail Kornienko, it's only the second one. The astronauts move by attaching carabiners to external handrails. Every spacesuit has two safety tethers, one and a half and two and a half meters long. A solid protection on an autonomous journey. The smallest push, even just touching the station with your finger, makes you fly. So you have to hold yourself with your arm too, and that's additional strain. If astronauts become really tired, Metis can give them some time to rest, because you need to have enough strength throughout the six hours of the spacewalk. Mikhail Kornienko is approaching the window he has to clean. The remaining onboard crew members are ready to take pictures of him from the other side. Using a special cleaning tool, the Cosmonaut removes the oily film that builds up on the glass when the station's thrusters fire. Just a few minutes of work, take care of the space there like it has never been there in the first place. All operations in outer space are scheduled down to the minute. Mostly it's technical maintenance of the orbiting station, rigging fixtures for the onboard communications antenna, installing handrails, replacing equipment and configuring instruments. Some might say nothing spacey about that, but all of that is what makes normal life on board the ISS possible. Also, during their spacewalk, Gennady Padalik and Mikhail Kornienko work on the scientific program of the year-long expedition. As part of various experiments, they take multiple photos, collect samples that have to be delivered to labs on Earth, and dismantle expired scientific equipment, and send it off to fly. The footage made by the astronauts shows the station entering the Earth's shadow. In this moment, the temperature drops down more than 200 degrees. During the crew's EVA, the ISS completed three full orbits around our planet. Gennady Podolka and Mikhail Kornienko finished their work ahead of schedule. Their spacewalk lasted five hours and 34 minutes.
Oleg Kononenko is meeting Mikhail and Gennady on board. He is also a Russian cosmonaut. We'll get to know him closer soon. Oleg will take part in a unique experiment on robot control. But for now, you can see how the space conquerors rest. And once again, realize that astronauts are exceptional people, prepared for extraordinary deeds, even after hard work in outer space. Dear viewers, a bit of space acrobatics especially for you. This happens sometimes. And a bit of gymnastics. Even with just one hand, can you do that? 